Joy, I followed you on Twitter, live tweeting your hearing today. I saw the precious few minutes you got at the end of your 7 p.m. hour because of the way that the testimony went uh, today. And I thought Joy has a lot more to say. Uh, and so, Joy, we begin with you and the open mic. Go ahead. <laughs> You are so merciful, uh, Lawrence. You could feel my frustration, I think, through my Twitter feed. You know, I watched this all day, as you did. And you know, let me just start with just what we, what we know from having watched this today very quickly. So we know that these senators don't know the difference between what judges do and what they are supposed to do, right? They kept questioning Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson about you know, her ideas on the way legislation should be formed in terms of sentencing guidelines, that's their job. I haven't seen Tom Cotton's legislation or any of their legislation to try to change said sentencing guidelines, as you just showed. We know that they don't care about protecting women and girls. We know that they don't care about protecting them from things like rape or child pornography because they fully support one justice who caused the phrase long dong silver to be entered into the congressional record, Clarence Thomas. And they fully support Justice Kavanaugh, who was credibly accused of sexual violence against a teenager in high school. So we had a lot of Josh Hawley fulminating about protecting children from pornography, et cetera, and Tom Cotton going on about protecting women from rape, et cetera. They supported fully Justice Kavanaugh and were outraged that anyone would ask him about these three credible accusations of sexually violating teenagers and college students, okay? So we know they don't really care about that. They also fully support Donald Trump, who has 26 accusers going all the way from having leered at teenage girls at beauty pageants he was in charge of to rape in the case of E. Jean Carroll, all the way up to 26 accusers. So we know they don't care about any of that. We also know they don't care about the rule of law because they refuse to convict Donald Trump of fomenting an insurrection, which Josh Hawley raised his fist to support in real time. So we know they don't care about any of that, rule of law, the law, none of it. What they care about is performing because their real job, much like Margie Green, is not to legislate, it is to perform, to perform for the Fox News audience, to perform for far-right voters who are terrified that their children will learn that slavery was bad and that slaves weren't happy and singing in the fields. They're terrified, and so they want to perform for that audience so that they'll vote. And so what I saw today was the performance of QAnon, QAnon ideology, trying to tie this woman who has perfect integrity that Lindsey Graham has voted for twice to be on the federal bench, to try to tie her to child pornography because they know that's going to activate QAnon voters in November. It was pure performative, it was repulsive, and it was purely thuggish, and, in my view. And Senator McCaskill, uh, through it all, we still saw... Uh, the most qualified Supreme Court nominee who's ever appeared in a televised confirmation hearing. First of all, I hate to interrupt Joy, because I know she's got a lot more to say about this. Um, <laughs> right, but right. <laughs> uh, let me start with a very important premise here. This woman that was in front of the Judiciary Committee was brilliant, absolutely brilliant on the law, in her demeanor. This was a, a woman wearing a velvet glove with a steel spine. She didn't let them rattle her. She showed how she will be able to get along with others, which is important in the close confines of nine justices on the Supreme Court to try to win people over to your perspective on cases that could go either way. We hope we will get back to those cases someday. Um, so I, I, I think we got to give a lot of credit to her. Secondly, uh, this was a whack-a-mole game of hypocrisy. Every time I thought the Republicans had reached a new level of hypocrisy, whoops, up it came again. Whether it was them lamenting dark money, give me a break. The only reason we have dark money is because they love it. They won't clean it up. We've given them a million opportunities to clean it up. They won't vote for it. They love dark money. They are the princes of dark money and the hypocrisy about downward um, sentencing from the guidelines. They have so many judges they've supported and that sit on the bench, appointed by Republicans, confirmed by them, that have had downward sentences from the guidelines. In, if any of these guys had ever been in a courtroom for a sentencing, they would know this is not that unusual. 
And so they cherry picked a couple of cases to try to make America believe that this mother, this amazing woman somehow likes pedophiles and child pornographers. Nobody believes that except that little rigid QAnon crowd that they're all playing to. That 25 percent of America that still think the guy at Mar-a-Lago uh, tells the truth. The framers were concerned about government overreach in a lot of different areas. The provisions of our Constitution are protecting individual liberty from government overreach. This is why we have provisions about limited government. And there are many provisions in the Constitution that are limiting government action when it comes to the deprivation of liberty, because the framers understood how important liberty is to our society. And so there's the Fourth Amendment, there's the Fifth Amendment, there's the Sixth Amendment, there's the Eighth Amendment. These provisions are crucial, and it is zealous defense counsel that ensures that the government is protecting these rights, is that ensures that these rights are protected and that people are getting due process in the criminal justice system. And joining us now, Michelle Batcher Goodwin, Chancellor's Professor at the University of California, Irvine Law School and host of the podcast On the Issues with Michelle Goodwin. Also with us, Rakeem Brooks, President of the Alliance for Justice and a Public Interest Appellate Lawyer. Professor Goodwin, uh, let me begin with you. And, and uh, the reason we showed that particular uh, piece of her testimony is this is one of those rare moments where we have a Supreme Court nominee who has actually represented criminal defendants in courtrooms in trials. That's right. And let's be clear, this is critically important. The first 10 amendments of the U.S. Constitution, known as the Bill of Rights, protects individuals from the tyranny of the state. As she enumerated, many of those amendments directly speak to protecting people who have been accused of crimes by the government and protecting their interests. It's something that previously was a revered aspect of our Constitution, and we appreciated the public servants who dedicated themselves to serving on behalf of people who are indigent criminal defendants, such as then public federal defenders or just public defenders, those who represent people at the state level. So this is a noble calling that she has taken up in the past. And unfortunately, what we've seen is a kind of level of scorched earth politicking uh, today with regard to what otherwise has been perceived and understood as a very noble calling. And in fact, the importance of zealous advocacy, which is not just something that lawyers can put up or put down, but is actually required by a code of ethics that lawyers must adhere to. She doesn't get to choose. Rakeem Brooks, uh, what did, did you take away from the hearing in terms of important points made by the nominee? You know, ultimately, what we witnessed was her sheer brilliance. I just smiled watching the clip at the very beginning. We all know how extraordinary she is from day one, but today that was on display for multiple hours under really grueling conditions. And I think the point that she made most clearly was that she really is a judge's judge. She looks at the facts, she looks at the law, and she applies it equally regardless of the parties before her. She's not favoring the wealthy and the powerful. She's not favoring any party. What she does as a judge is looks at the facts, looks at the law, and applies it. And so many times, Republicans tried to corner her and say, are you originalist or a textualist? as a way of trying to almost say that those were the neutral principles by which our legal system should be governed. And the truth is, those principles are not uh, are at all neutral. They tilt in a particular direction. And she avoided that because she's a judge's judge. She looks at the facts, looks at the law, and applies it. Professor Goodwin, I think in uh, the especially the most recent uh, confirmation hearings, the last few decades, we've been seeing some very 
carefully constructed resumes, uh, nominees from Democratic presidents and Republican presidents. And you can see caution in those resumes, uh, including uh, if I'm going to work as a trial lawyer uh, in a criminal case, it better be prosecutor because they'll be OK with that That's in right. Senate confirmation hearings. Uh, there's just a whole set of career choices you can see people making. Uh, and here we see a nominee who made the risky choice of saying, no, I will stand up uh, as a federal public defender for whoever is assigned to me. Doesn't even, she didn't even get to choose uh, who she would be representing. Uh, what message does that send to young lawyers, people in law school now, who are thinking about just how do they want to shape their resumes so that they might someday be able to get through one of these hearings? Lawrence, I'm glad that you asked that. There are two things that come through and, and more. One is her integrity, because you're absolutely right. There are law students who become nervous about even the potential of becoming a law clerk based on what they may write. And what we saw today was pure courage and integrity that has spanned a career. But there's something else that we've seen, given some of the vitriol and some of the unfair innuendo and inflammatory attacks. We see the strength that Black mothers pass on to their daughters, their granddaughters, and their nieces, and that is to walk through fire. And what we've seen is her ability to do that with poise, grace, and dignity under questioning that, as you mentioned, would have been off the table at another time. Uh, Rakeem Brooks, what about that point that, uh, that law students, young lawyers are very carefully shaping their resumes for these kinds of moments? And uh, Judge, th this nominee is showing you that you, you might be able to do some things that you didn't think you could do. I think it's incredibly important, and Professor Goodwin is exactly right. She's teaching law students all the time who are making calculations about what their careers will look like. And for the first time, they're going to look up at the Supreme Court in just a few months and see someone who honors one of our most cherished rights, right? When we think about Miranda, right before they tell you, that, before they put you in cuffs, they tell you you have an entitlement to a lawyer. And if you cannot afford one, one will be provided to you. It is as bedrock a principle in American law as anything. It's what makes us free. And for a long time, people avoided that to some extent because they were afraid that at confirmation hearings, just as we saw today with Senators Cruz and Senators Hawley, that they would be attacked for representing clients and defending that constitutional right. No more. Now law students will look ahead and say she stood there with courage. She defended the Constitution as she has her entire career. And now she moved on to the Supreme Court where she will continue to defend the Constitution of the United States. It's a glorious moment for us all. We have been trying to figure out what is the military progress uh, in this case. The information is imperfect. How have you been analyzing it, and what do you see as the military status of the, of the war right now? The fundamental problem the Russians are facing is that they've started a campaign with no idea what they were taking on, and they don't seem able to admit what they've done. They started a campaign they thought they would win in three to four days with light casualties, with sort of basic Ukrainian resistance that would end up with a victory parade in Kiev, uh, and it would all be over by now. They completely underestimated what the Ukrainians would do in resistance, and they overestimated what they could do. The issue that they face now is that they need to fight an entirely different war, and they're probably going to need a new army, because this army is from what we can tell, uh, in terrible shape. It's exhausted, it has frostbite, it has super high casualties. So they need to basically reconsider everything they're doing if they're going to have any chance to, to sort of impose a political solution that they want. But what we don't see is them sort of understanding that in the way that you would think, that they're still sort of sitting spread out around southeast and, and Ukraine and now not moving. So by a strategic sense, it doesn't seem that they really know what they're doing. Is, is there, I, there's no way of knowing now, but I suppose when the history of this is written, we will find out how much of this was in a certain sense deliberate uh, by troops whose not just hearts were not in this fight, their minds were not in this fight. They actually disapproved of this fight. 
Well, you know, there's a really interesting thing. And when you think about it, we think armies are modios. The soldiers are going to go in and they're going to you know, fight for their country or the propaganda. This regime that Putin has, you know, people are not in some ways wedded to it in the way we think. When people serve dictators or authoritarians, they often do it for the benefits. Uh, they don't want to die for a dictator. They don't want to die for this kind of brutal rule. And the Russian soldiers are looking here, and they're not going in saying, I'm fighting to defend my homeland, or I'm fighting to defend my mother and father. It's really, you know, I've been thrown into this thing. I wasn't told what this was going to be. I was de deceived about this invasion. The Ukrainians really hate me. Uh, they're fighting against me very hard. I've got frostbite. I've got terrible food. Uh, and it does look like the, the Russian soldier now is doing as much to protect you, know, to simply stay alive at this point, than to, to sustain military operations. What would it look like going forward uh, if the Russians were to change tactics? Well, they have to change an army. I mean, you can change all the tactics you want at this point, but this army has now been in the field for almost a month. It suffered huge casualties. This army probably has a few weeks left. Uh, there's no way they're going to be able to surround and take Kiev. I mean, they hardly move. I mean, if you look at the map, the Russian army has basically been, in, been immobile for most of the last two weeks. So it, they can't just change tactics. They're going to have to get almost a new army in if they're going to impose a solution to take over much more of Ukraine.